Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and watch this. This is hyperinflation at its finest. This is 40,000 Argentina pesos right here. Back in 2018, this was worth $2,000 American. Now it's worth about $75 American. You see, back in 2018, this 20 peso note was equivalent to $1 American. Now you need 520 just to equal that $1. This is all because of government spending, a poor economy, and the government printing large amounts of capital. Folks, that's why we're here. That's why I have a sponsor called Glint, referral code DAFV50, with get 50% off vaulting and insurance. I think you can still use this thing. I don't know. You'll have to go check. But link's in the top of the description. I buy physical gold. I buy Glint gold. This is my hedge. Besides crypto and XRP and all that. Uh-oh. Mr. Huber decided to stir the pot a little bit. I know you're going to call this crazy and absurd conspiracy theory, but maybe it's not that unlikely that Ripple doesn't own parts of the, the escrow, but has been pre-sold to other companies or institutions. Something that is actually not absurd at all. In this case, it would indeed be wrong to call the XRP and escrow the property of Ripple. Now, digital perspectives, who knows better? In fact, I did a crypto, I did a calling all cars, crypto police alert on Brad Combs from digital perspectives because he knows that you're not allowed to say the word pre-allocated pre option contracts. And he said it right here, didn't even care. <laughs> That's hashtag sarcasm, folks. Pre-allocated option contracts by Ripple are not a conspiracy theory. It has been confirmed through R3 option contract and others. There's nothing bad or wrong about having contractual relationships with institutions to make sure they don't dump on the market. In fact, it's good stewardship of the escrow. Remember, XRP is held, is, is held at $0 on Ripple's balance sheet. And then I'll remind you of something else. This is from the lawsuit. There were 1,700 contracts. Read them and weep. In fact, this is what I think most of that ruling that where the judge said the, these certain things are um, investment contracts. These are the contracts I believe she was referring to, or at least some of them. In discovery, the parties produced over 1,700 contracts, for, which are specific agreements by which Ripple transferred XRP to con contractual counterparties in a variety of commercial transactions. Um, then David Schwartz apparently outlined what the different categories of what these contracts were. By Ripple transferred, uh, contracts by Ripple transferred XRP directly to a counterparty. Contracts by which Ripple's counterparties agreed to sell XRP on behalf of Ripple over trading platforms. Three, contracts by Ripple paid for various counterparty services and XRP provided by Ripple but four miscellaneous contracts that do not fall into these three categories. So it's not absurd at all to think that there's pre-allocated uh, XRP. That's business. It's what you and I would probably do. In fact, Greg Kidd was another example of that. He had an option on a billion XRP. And if, you, if R3 and Greg Kidd were smart enough to do it, don't you think that other financial institutions and other people that were involved and met with Ripple and all that they would, those aren't going to be the, the only two smart people, great or people in companies, Greg Kidd and R3 on the planet that got this. Now, speaking of R3, here is, uh, this is Richard Gindel. He's the CTO of R3. He's old school. Watch this. What we begin to see is the emergence of these networks of networks, these openly connected networks working together to solve a, um, an end-to-end -end business problem without, and this is the important point, without them all having to be deployed on the same network with the same rules on the same technology, because in the regulated sphere, that just isn't feasible. I wonder what R3 is up to now. Remember, this is the same guy right here. Still working with Ripple at all? This is from a... 
year or two back, I think. As a company? I know there's always, you know, some extracurricular, you know, activity that was working its way through the courts, but, um, and, and, and it's since been resolved, but, but, uh, I'm curious if there's ongoing discussions since one of their primary focuses is on the, the, uh, interbank settlement component that you're also touching. So, frankly, Ripple's probably the only uh, topic I'm, I'm, I just I can't talk about. It. Um, so, <laughs> I, uh, I, just, I just, I just, it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. I just don't talk about it. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm just, I can't talk about it. And as I recall, I'm, I'm just, I just can't, can't talk can't. about Ripple. So, he's got NDAs. Um, and as I recall, that was that clip was from XRP Darren's, um, Darren Moore's video. Go check him out. Elon Musk is soon to soon to be Super App X, formerly known as Twitter, is looking for financial data giant to build a trading hub inside of the app, according to report. That's going to be interesting, and he's monetizing too. Now, this right here, things start to make a little sense. Did you know that BlackRock owns eight percent of MicroStrategy? BlackRock bought 757,146 shares over a year ago. The signs were there. And um, Gary Gensler, look what he did. All of a sudden he gets drop kicked with crypto and so he pivots. SEC Chair Gensler has stated that he intends to prioritize regulations regarding artificial intelligence over those for cryptocurrencies. So that's what you do when you have all the power that, that he has had and you still lose because you don't have the truth on your side, you pivot to something else, distract from your loss. This was big. This hit yesterday afternoon and I'm going to spend some time on it. Jason Foster from Empower Oversight. They, the Empower Oversight litigation forces SEC to release additional documents on cryptocurrency conflicts. There were 324 pages, folks. Um, it says the latest batch uh, uh, follows a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit brought by Empower. Joseph Lubin and Consensus played a more central role than previously known in then-SEC Director of Corporate Finance's William Hinman's controversial June 14, 2018 speech. Remember when, when this all started, folks, Bill Hinman said this was his, his, only his personal opinion. Wait till you see all the things that were going on behind the scenes. Lubin also apparently brought Hinman and Ethereum, uh, brought Hinman and Ethereum creator Vitalik Buterin together as the speech was drafted. <laughs> These people, investors and attorneys closely associated with the with Ethereum, were prominent on the list. March 28, 2018 meeting. Now, folks, all of this was pieced together by us by finding videos of their own words that were publicly available on YouTube. We, we literally just tied all the threads together until we had the timeline that now we're starting. None of this would ever have been seen if the XRP army had not gone to work and started digging. And, and it was all their arrogant, publicly said words, all of it. August 22, 2019, email shows Hinman met with Simpson Thatcher partner Chris Lynn while Lynn was representing Canaan, a crypto mining client, on its IPO. SEC Ethics Office had repeatedly warned him and against such meetings since he, was, he, was received, he had received millions in payments from Simpson Thatcher while at the SEC. So I pulled, and other people, some of the sleuths have pulled different sections out of this that are just unbelievable, folks. First of all, this is an email sent by Joseph Lubin to try and get an SEC meeting. This is not Gary Gensler that he's talking to. This is a guy named Gary Barnett, who I'm assuming is somebody that's either at the SEC or had connections at the SEC. But remember, Bill Hinman said they didn't, when he, when he did the Ethereum free pass speech, he said they didn't see any third party promoter with Ethereum. The third party promoter literally sent this email to try and get the meeting. This is from Joseph Lubin to this Gary Barnett. He's basically trying to get Gary Barnett to hook him up with the SEC. It was a pleasure seeing you in Singapore and exciting that you remain interested in, in our fledgling ecosystem. As we discussed, we remain very interested in engaging in discussions with regulators around the world and probably most important body is the SEC. While we remain confident in our prudent approach to token launches, we see he, he was la launching tokens even then. 
We're eager to edu educate regarding the benefits of tokenization and eager for our ecosystem to be able to operate in the United States with, gr with uh, greatly reduced uncertainty. We've begun to gather interested parties to help jointly define best practices for token launches. So he goes on and on and on here. This eventually is what leads to them getting a meeting. Right here, um, now we know, <laughs> um, all right, let me, let me see where we're, these are the people that were involved in the um, March 28th, 2018 meeting. This was the presentation. Remember where Nancy Wotas said that Brad Burnham gave an awesome presentation? We played that video several times. Well, these now we know the people that were in the meeting. Two Andrees and Horowitz guys, a bunch of Perkins Cooey attorneys, um, two or three or four Union Square Ventures people. And don't forget while you're looking at this, folks, Remember, Andrews and Horwitz was an investor in Ripple. And I'm at, I actually asked Ripple um, here. I said, just realize I've never asked Ripple, did Andrews and Horwitz or Scott Cooper, who's one of their big dogs, did they at least give you guys at Ripple a heads up since they're an investor in Ripple that they were about to have closed door meetings with the SEC to try to get Ethereum a free pass? At the time, you were still in purgatory with XRP. Remember Brad Garlinghouse and David Schwartz met with with the SEC and Jay Clayton and Bill Hinman basically steered them away from any discussions on XRP and said, let's just talk about your business. That's really not appropriate for here. And then Bill Hinman came back, literally left the SEC and came back to make sure the Ripple lawsuit was filed. Okay. So it's a great question to ask, did these VC people that were literally investors in Ripple did they literally do this and not even give Ripple a heads up? Is this how dirty this is? Um, now, um, then I asked this. This is this is from this is unbelievable, folks. This is from Bill Hinman <clears throat> after his meeting with uh, his first meeting with Joseph Lubin. He's kissing his butt. Okay. He says, Dear Joe, I greatly enjoyed meeting with you and your team at our offices a couple of months ago. I was wondering if we could have a brief call in order to discuss the possibility of another meeting with you. Can we do this, Joe? Please? If this is something that could be possible, we can work with your assistant to set up a time and a place. Is it possible, Joe? Can we meet with you, please? And this is, I said to Brad Garlinghouse, as I recall, Jay Clayton and Bill Hintman didn't think it was appropriate to talk about XRP in your me meetings and just wanted to focus on your business. What you, what you didn't have, uh, you didn't have them emailing you like this to have a follow-up meeting to discuss tokens. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. And if you think that's it, keep watching. Now, Jason Foster, after this document dump, he's he's saying, "What is the SEC's Office of Inspector General doing about this?" We have another pending FOIA, so there's more coming, folks, seeking all SEC communications about our May 2022 referral. So um, they're, they're asking, uh, you already produced enough evidence, this is from John Deaton's law firm, public to see that Hinman not only ignored the general, in, general counsel on his ETH speech, he ignored ethics offices bar under the criminal financial conflict with Simpson Thatcher. And then here's another one. <laughs> this is from Wheezy. Christina Littman, who supervised the SEC's lawsuit against Ripple, was in these ETH free pass meetings. But what do we know? It's all conspiracy th theory. And there she is. She's literally in the freaking Andrews and Horwitz. The same woman who's going to be in charge of the Ripple lawsuit is in the meetings with Scott Co Cooper and Ryan Ward from Andrews and Horwitz, who are investors in Ripple. What in the world is going, but he's, he's even got this. Look, the case is being supervised by Christina Littman, the case against Ripple. Now, check this out. As if it could get even more absurd, it couldn't get any more absurd. Look at this. This is from an SEC attorney, okay, talking about how consensus is, is going to come in and talk and all that. And this is from an SEC attorney to Bill Hinman saying, could we provide a list of questions or at least a list of topics in advance to Vitalik Buterin? 
folks, this couldn't get much more in your face, absurd, and a lot of other, a lot of much worse things. Okay. Then we've got this. Remember crypto mom Hester Pierce, who at every turn has been um, the great defender of crypto, and Gary Gensler is doing all these bad things, and she just disagrees. Remember her? Well, look at this from Wheezy right here. That group that was meeting behind closed doors to, 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 to discuss what would eventually become the Ethereum free pass, this group will be meeting with Commissioner Pierce at 2 p.m. and would like to talk to us about utility tokens. I'll let them know that we have the open meeting scheduled for the 18th, so we may have limited attendance from our side. Please attend if you'd like. So Hester, we now know Hester Pierce knew what was being discussed and what was going on. That should possibly infuriate many people out there, rightly so. Invite Bill Hunt, this is from Cowboy Crypto, who is the official cowboy of the Digital Asset Investor Channel, and don't take that title lightly. Invite to Bill Hinman from Consensus on 423. Now, in case you're wondering, Gary Gens, I've always said, Gary Gens, remember the New York Times article, we're out of nowhere. I had, I had never even heard of Gary Gensler at the time, and I remember covering it on my channel. Out of nowhere, Gary Gensler comes, he, all he was was a retired CFTC guy that was, that was now at MIT or whatever. Came out of nowhere to just give his opinion in the New York Times that I think that Rip, uh, definitely Ripple and probably Ethereum are securities. Securities. Well, that same day is the day that Bill Hinman invite consensus. It's almost like Gary Gensler's the thing was either to to uh, create a sense of urgency so that the SEC would act to give Ethereum a free pass, or Gary is just a pure Bitcoin guy and he caught wind. But we know Gary knew that these talks were going on because he was on video in a video talking about it. Then look at this, Crypto Cowboy, he says, this call leads me to believe the SEC used it to confirm Ether was not decentralized. If you look at the, these are the questions for the call. These are the questions the SEC put together for the call, which leads me to believe that they knew exactly that Ethereum, Ethereum was a security and all this stuff. Can you describe the early days of Ethereum development following following the initial pre-sale, so they know that was a security. What's the current role of the foundation? They know all of this, folks. They knew it. They, they literally molded this speech and molded this whole discussion to, remember what Lowell Ness said? He said, what we wanted to do was get Bitcoin and Ethereum out from under securities laws. So that was the mission. In other words, let's, let's figure out a way to BS all the legalities of this so that we can get them out from under securities laws. That was the mission. Remember when, this is from John Deaton, Hinman asked, did you, did you have communications with anyone other than the SEC staff about the substance of your remarks on June 14th, 2018 speech before you gave it? Now, think about everything I just showed you. He's talking to Joseph Lubin. He's in the, he, they're having meetings with all these VCs and all these people. And he, they said, did you have communications? He says, no, not on the substance. The whole damn, all these meetings were about the substance, folks. They just gave you a series of questions I just showed you. These questions, Joseph, uh, Bill Hinman, him and his people came up with these questions to ask those guys in the meetings. This is just flat out lie in a deposition. This is what I came away with after going through all that. Just went through the Empower Jason Foster FOA, FOIA documents. Obvious questions. Why was Bill Hinman doing backflips to accommodate Joseph Lubin and Vitalik Buterin while at the same time giving Brad Garlinghouse the run around with the help of Jay Clayton and even coming back to the SEC after he left to make sure the Ripple lawsuit went through? That's the question, folks. I think I'm going to stop there. I'll do this other stuff in the next video. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe. Hit the like button. Tell your friends and family that we're way past smoke rising off of all this. 
if we have if we have a country anymore if we have a justice system anymore these people all get investigated and they don't get investigated today or tomorrow they get investigated yesterday where is the inspector general what is the person at the sec doing who's supposed to be looking into this where's congress where's warren davidson where's patrick mchenry where where is is uh tom emmer where is everybody investigating this this is obvious what's going on here this has to be cleaned up the trash has to be taken out it's the only way for anybody to have any faith in our government and, all, and these agencies that these people have squandered the faith in. Thanks for listening.